Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you today? This is Dennison, your host of Through the Looking Glass here on WIOX Radio at 91.3 FM. And we're so glad to be here. It's Monday morning. We're here always from 9 to 10 a.m. And today, August 28th, I'm looking at the end of summer. <laughs> it's a little frightening to me. I know technically it goes to September 21st, but um, summer, as in summer, uh, July, August, is going to be over soon and that's a little disheartening for me but it's a great day and any any winter day if someone said i could have this day in uh in the middle of january i would take it hands down so it's going to be a really nice day weather in the 70s sunny uh lucky to be alive today here in the catskill mountains today we have a really interesting show we have um members of the lgb alliance speaking to us uh, interviewed two activists uh, last week and uh, from the West Coast and they were fabulous and before I get to them I just want to say a little bit about the LGB Alliance they are uh, a group that envisions a world where lesbians gay men bisexuals can live free from homophobia in all social legal political spheres a world in which the same sex orientation is widely accepted and LGB spaces are both prevalent and easy accessible now that's lgb it's not lgbt and that's one of the main reasons they formed their alliance is because the t had been kind of added to the lbg they didn't put it there it didn't come organically it was kind of cemented dropped on top of it and um i think for many of us that's lgbt t added t okay more love but there's an issue here, uh, same-sex orientation, a real sexual orientation versus sort of this fluid thing um, that is causing some issues for certainly lesbian, gay men, and bisexuals. So we're going to hear more about it. But first, I want to just play a little trailer here of the W. Um, GB Alliance, LGB Alliance in the USA, and here's a little trailer of theirs I'm going to play, and then we'll launch into our interviews with the activists. Whoop. I'm sorry about that. We still have a big thief going on with Spud Infinity here. All right, here we go with the LGB Alliance. Thanks for hanging with me here on WIOX. Contrary to popular belief, LGB and T are not all the same thing. However, the first three letters do have something in common. LGB refers to sexual orientation, and more specifically, same-sex attraction. Lesbian refers to homosexual women, or women who are exclusively same-sex attracted. Likewise, gay refers to homosexual men, or men who are exclusively same-sex attracted. And bisexual refers to those who are sexually attracted to members of both the opposite sex and the same sex. This is why acknowledging the existence of biological sex is so important. It's because sexual orientation is defined according to one's own sex and what sex he or she is attracted to in relation to it. Without biological sex, homosexuality, bisexuality, and heterosexuality are meaningless concepts. And this is where the divide between the LGB and the T begins. The LGB and the T refer to two different communities with different needs. While the LGB refers to same-sex attraction, the T refers to something that is unrelated to same-sex attraction, namely, gender identity. LGB Alliance advocates for the rights of same-sex attracted individuals and offers community to support their needs. We lead the fight for sex-based rights because we believe that identity should not be allowed to trump biological reality. All right, so that was a trailer by the LGB Alliance, and I had the tremendous pleasure of interviewing two of their activists on the West Coast, Sylvia and Ariane, and I'm going to go to my interview with them we had last week uh, here in um, the Catskills, and um, they're going to share their experiences. First off, why they joined the LGB Alliance, how did they get involved uh, as two lesbians living on the West Coast, why was this suddenly something they felt like they had to be a part of? So you'll see to Through the Looking Glass, we're going to hear again from two LGB Alliance activists, Sylvia and Ariane. Here we go. So I, I got involved back in 2019 or the very beginning of 2020. 
Um, I distinctly remember, though, when I found out that the LGB Alliance UK had started back in, I want to say, 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, that was just such a beacon of hope. And I was like, OK, like, that's exactly I, I've been saying we need some sort of LGB unity movement um, in the United States. So when I saw it happening in the UK, I got really excited. And then, you know, I just kept Googling LGB Alliance USA, LGB Alliance USA, until eventually something popped up on Instagram and I messaged them and I was like, I want to volunteer for you. Like, let me let me be a part of this. Um, And so I've been going to, you know, volunteer meetings and helping kind of shape this this new wave of LGB activism um, with LGB Alliance as far as um, community building goes and some political action, too. Fabulous. How about yourself, Ariane? Yeah, so for me, see, I got involved with LGB Alliance, I guess, at the beginning of 2022, if I'm remembering correctly. I had heard of them at the end of the year before, and that was really the time that I was starting to peak. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a very slow process for me, and I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so it's... and a place that's really entrenched with even before it was cool with a lot of this stuff. And so it took a long time for me to really see all the problems that were building up. There were problems with the lesbian dating. There were problems with the trans, you know, kids phenomenon that really bothered me. Um, There were, you know, there was the whole JK Rowling fiasco and all those things just fell into place bit by bit. And eventually, um, when I found out that the LGB Alliance USA was holding, um, uh, was getting together and they were holding Zooms, I, uh, joined some of those Zooms and then, um, I got in contact, uh, with them as a volunteer at the beginning of 2022. Great. So, um, Sylvia, so you mentioned, um, the UK. Uh, the LGB Alliance in the UK won a big lawsuit or yeah, recently, right? They were going to be sued, uh, by another, it's first time maybe another charity, one charity group has sued another charity group to take away their charity status. Yeah. Uh, I didn't read that twice when I saw that. Um, so the mermaid group is, how would you describe them? They're a group that advocates for advocates and fundraises for trans people's rights and, 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 um, and body, so to speak? Yeah, my understanding uh, is that they really advocate for trans youth or, or children, children and young adults who would like to medically change their bodies to appear like the opposite sex. They're They're really advocating for that to be more easily accessible and then educating the public on uh, gender ideology. So just the concept of, you know, gender identity and kind of the whole paradigm that creates transgenderism, um, I think is kind of their goal to just spread awareness in that. Um, I, they're founded by a woman who, and Ariane, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I'm correct in this, that, you know, she had a, a son that, she helped transition to be a a trans woman. And, you know, so she's, she's a, she's a parent of a trans child. Um, So yeah, big, big on spreading awareness and all of that. Right. Great. You agree with that, Ariane? Yeah. I don't have anything to add. So, um, so they wanted to take a lawsuit against the LGB Alliance of England and they lost Thank God. The judges dismissed it, said, what is, you know, there's nothing here. Um, I don't think they're going to go away, though. They're going to keep coming after you guys. Why are they so threatened? Some Most people that I know will see LGBT, and they go, oh, yeah, that's perfect. But the T doesn't quite fit with the LGB. And maybe you guys can give background to our listeners on that. Yeah, so this is uh, – the the T was really added. I guess the impression I get is that it was really sometime in the 90s where there was this push to include 
uh, the tea. And it's kind of, I, I mean, I, being the age that I am, I can't give a whole lot of personal background on, on exactly, um, exactly how that manifested. But there were many, many, um, sort of pushes in some ways, very heavy handed pushes by the T to really piggyback on the gay rights movement so that they would have an easier time gaining acceptance by sort of taking on what was people were already doing with the gay rights movement, even though it was only tangentially related. It's true that there was a lot of overlap, that there are a lot of, for example, people who start as gay, you know, they are gay, and then they take on, they do transition and then identify as someone of the opposite gender or the opposite sex. And so there was, you know, a lot of um, parallels between, there were a lot of overlap between gay community and cross-dressing, uh, cross-dresser community and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the trans issue sort of took a life of its own Um and also, you know, like around 2000, there was this big, uh, uh, one big motion to, to sort of push the T into the, the, uh, the rest was, um, I don't know if you've heard of the whole saga with the Michigan Women's Festival, but that was like a big, uh, women's festival, a music festival that was for all women, but it was really largely lesbians who really liked the Michigan Women's Festival. And so there was just a whole campaign on the part of these male to female uh, uh, trans to be able to go to the Michigan Women's Festival. And one thing that happened is that a lot of eventually what happened is some of these so-called old, old gay rights groups, like the Human Rights Campaign, basically would, uh, were so heavy handed. What they would do is they would say any artist and any uh, including any gay artist or lesbian artist, a uh, musician who participated in the Michigan Women's Festival, that they would be blacklisted by the human rights campaign until the Michigan Women's Festival allowed trans. So that would be like one example of how. And I should say allowed men because they yeah. allowed women they, who identify as trans. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is sort of uh it's an attack then really on uh lesbian gay bi spaces almost the way it is uh in in rest in in restrooms and in sports uh the trans movement has really invaded women's spaces. I'm really glad you said that because I wanted to bring up um the the co-opting of the lesbian feminist movement um by straight men um not to point fingers or anything, but, um, you know, there was a, a group of, of men who fancied themselves women and fancied themselves lesbian. So they're straight men, but they want to appear like they're women. And they, um, framed their exclusion from lesbian spaces as oppression and as bigotry in the same way that lesbians in the, 1970s, 80s, I'm so bad with my feminist history, lesbians were being excluded from feminist activisms because some straight women felt that lesbians were, you know, acting like men because they were into women or that they didn't, you know, there was just some homophobia happening. And lesbians fought really hard, lesbian feminists, I should say, fought really hard to be included in, in those certain spaces. And there was a whole... um uh, uh, protest where a group of lesbians kind of tongue in cheek took this, 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 um, phrase, we need to keep the lesbian menaces out of, you know, feminist spaces. So these lesbians are like, all right, well, we'll be lesbian men menaces. So they went and they protested and it was like a powerful moment to be like, we're women too. You include us. Well, these men who fancy themselves as women and as lesbians, then decided, well, we're going to be the transsexual menaces. And they showed up to lesbian spaces and, like I said, framed their exclusion on the basis of their sex as you're being transphobic in the way that lesbians were saying, well, you're being homophobic. Now, the difference is that lesbians are actually women. 
and you know <laughs> should be included right and a famous lesbian actress or sorry a lesbian author wrote a book called the transsexual empire her name was janice raymond and she wrote that book in i think 1970 1970 something and that was that book has been banned you will not be able to find it in any library or any bookstore but this lesbian wrote it and it, it is eerie how much she just framed this is what's happening to lesbians now and this is what will happen to greater society and it's like she just took a time machine and mm -hmm. is writing it out play by play from politics to sports everything um so i just i had to get that out because it, it really has affected the lesbians first and it's now bled into all of society yeah and it's really interesting the timeline on this because i remember i think it was maybe sometime in as recently as maybe 2012 or so mm -hmm. maybe like 10 years ago or more um when you would go to say okay cupid and you would, you know, try to do online dating as a lesbian. You know how, I don't know if you've ever done OK Cupid, but they have these questions. I met my wife there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Well, there, you know how they're like, there are these questions that they'll ask you and try to match you up with people according to how you answer the questions and such. And one of the questions back then in the year 2012 was, would you be willing to date a transgender person? And at the time, it was, you know, you could say yes or no to that. And I don't remember. There were definitely people who said no. And I don't recall a huge pushback yet. But now, you know, as of the past several years, first of all, those questions have are completely gone. It's, they've been overhauled to be entirely political. And now you basically, uh, in any, whether it's OkCupid or any online uh, dating thing as a lesbian, you cannot put in your profile, I don't want to date a trans woman because that would be considered bigotry and could get your profile banned. So even over a relatively short period of time, over several years, there's been a real drastic change in that regard. And so you've got essentially met men or women with penises on lesbian sites or trans women men with and they say they're lesbians and you're wrong or you're a sexual racist in a sense if you're not interested in that yeah and they've even co coined the term the cotton ceiling which again is another appropriation of the feminist movement um the original term being the glass ceiling, which was talking about, you know, women's inability to break through that one power barrier. And now um, trans activists are saying that trans women experience a very similar oppression um, in their underwear made out of cotton, hence the cotton ceiling. And it's when a lesbian will fully see you as a woman until they take your pants off and they see that you're not actually a woman. Um, and I'd first also like to say that there's a lot more ways than just the private parts to tell when a man is a man, even mm -hmm. if he's gotten surgeries and, you know, you can't change your bone structure. It's really hard to cover up male uh, socialization. But and that aside, you know, um, yeah, framing it again is like I've been told that I have to unpack my genital preferences, that I'm a genital fetishist. Obviously, I'm transphobic. I'm a turf. All these things. I've lost. I've lost good friends for simply saying a penis is not a female sex organ. Um, yeah. Yeah, and with just people who call themselves allies too, which really hurts. Sorry, Ariane, go ahead. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, I was just gonna just to give a, a sense of sort of numbers here too, because I think oftentimes you hear people say things like, "Oh, well." trans there's such a small minority of the population why is this such an issue lesbians only make up like one percent of the population and a great majority of men who identify as trans who transition are straight men so they're identifying in, into being a lesbian so that's actually a huge number of people that are identifying into a relatively small percentage of the population that makes a really big impact on lesbian communities and that doesn't 
even consider the issue too, which is sort of a separate issue of how many lesbians have transitioned it into being men, into being trans men. So the impact this has had on lesbians in particular is really enormous. It's almost like, I mean, Jordan Peterson got in trouble for in Canada for not wanting to use pronouns. We're not, he, he said, I'll gladly call you what you want me to call you, but I don't want to be compelled to call you that. Um, never in Western society has speech been compelled. We've banned certain things. We've never forced. And it sounds like they're forcing or compelling a preference, a sexual preference onto lesbians that simply isn't there. Um, this is Dennison, your host of Through the Looking Glass, and we are talking to two activists, Sylvia and Ajian, from the LBG Alliance. It's LGBUSA. Dot or, uh, dot org lgbusa dot org is the le- um, lesbian gay bi alliance. You can go look them up. Tremendous website. You can get involved if you are interested. And they're going to continue here with sort of the uh, invasion the trans movement has had upon, um, in their case, lesbian spaces, but certainly gay and bi as well. And we're going to continue with that here on Through the Looking Glass. Is that what it feels like? Ab- absolutely. And and they're attempting conversion therapy. Um, I have countless videos of, of men, men who call themselves women, who identify as women, whatever, um, saying that, you know, if if a woman is so averse to to male genitals that they need to go seek therapy and and learn to overcome that disgust because it's bigotry. And it's like that's quite literally conversion therapy and you know 20 years ago the norm was okay i'm a sinner and i should go to convert i should go to therapy to undo this terrible thing and now it's okay i'm transphobic and i need to go to therapy to undo this it's the exact same arguments it's just the reason for the morality is different um i've heard the term used it's a it's a new homophobia yeah um, do you feel that way, Ariane? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and this was also something that um, is another thing that makes this different from the gay rights issue. Acceptance of homosexuality doesn't require overriding biology. With the trans thing, you're actually asking people to accept an identity that overrides biology and then by extension also you know your biologically rooted sexual preferences your your sexual orientation it, it it's just a fundamentally re, uh, reworking of <laughs> of science in a way and and it's not something that really um i think can really be maintained in a society that actually expects to be grounded in objective reality have either of you been confronted with this, with a, a, a man claiming to be a lesbian who was offended that maybe you weren't interested? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the first time that I um, was called a turf was because I was talking to a a friend of mine, and he um, he identified as a woman. He was newly out, I guess. And I sent him a video, a YouTube video of a woman claiming, you know, saying, okay, trans women are women, but trans women are not female, you know, and in this video, they were trying to make a distinction between biological sex and gender or whatever. And at that point in time in my life, I was still kind of drinking the Kool-Aid and believed in gender identity. At that time, I think I identified as non-binary. Um, but I said to my friend you know see this is great like i see you as a woman it's just like we have differences you're you're you'll you're not female and um he got really offended by that and i had to kind of walk it back and not in that same conversation he tried to talk about how you know in middle school when sorry my dog's barking um in in middle school when you know he was really crushing on me and harassing me about not liking him back that, you know, that was, that was your first lesbian experience. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. 
not not at all. You were a boy and you, I didn't like you back. And I was actually going through, you know, discovering my sexuality um, and not liking boys, but liking girls. And then to have you. So don't act like you were part of my, you know, coming out. Um, and And when I talked with him more about his, quote, lesbian identity, the way that he interacts with other women and the way that he related to other women was really appalling to me. And I remember thinking to myself, no lesbian would ever talk about another woman in that way. No lesbian would ever think about a woman's body in that way. And it was just really disturbing to hear him talk about being with women and then acting as if that was a lesbian experience. And mm -hmm. um, at the time, I did not feel comfortable to say, that's messed up. Don't talk like that in front of me. Um, no lesbian would ever want you to do that. Um, and I, the, I'll end on this. I just remember at one point he asked me, you know, what, what will it take for you to find a penis attractive? And I remember thinking like, I, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> like, as I don't, I, you know, but he, it almost, you know, I'm not trying to say he transitioned to get with me, but it did feel that, you know, it may be, maybe for some men, they transition because they, they don't have any luck with women. They're like, well, I'll try being a lesbian then, you know, it's a weird and lesbians don't want any of them. No. Ariane, same question to you. Yeah. I have not had any direct experience the way uh, Sylvia has. I've mostly been able to avoid the problem by just ignoring the, the DMs I get from people who are obviously male. Um, I'm I'm 34. Mm -hmm. um, I have noticed that it's a much worse problem um, for lesbians who are younger, like younger than 30. Um, a lot of lesbians who are like now sort of college age, each or you know even more disturbingly high school age have reported this as being a very big problem for them and it worries me because you know at that age you're vulnerable and you don't always know who you are and the only thing you've ever been told from these you know gay rights so-called you know you know these lgbtq plus groups is how you're a bigot for not <laughs> being willing to date males who consider themselves women um that's really a huge nightmare. And I think Sylvia did a good job at, you know, explaining. So on a dating site, say, okay, Cupid, you have to then check that you will date today. You have to check you will date a transgender woman. The question isn't asked anymore. Ah, okay. Okay. That I, all the questions have been revamped. I've been kicked off of uh, one dating app, Tinder. Boohoo, because I said explicitly only people of my same sex or my same biology, I'm not interested in males. I got booted within 24 hours. And then when I used Bumble, um, they didn't have an option for only females. Um, you could pick your preferences, but you could have wom women, which, um, included every, you know, men who call themselves women. And you could have, um, you, you could choose that you only want trans women, though, which was interesting to me. But you couldn't choose that you only want biological female women. Um, and I, Eve, I had an email back and forth where I was like, look, I just want women. I don't care if they call themselves women. I don't care if she identifies as a man. I don't care if she calls herself, you know, a purple alien. Like, it, as long as they were born a woman or born biologically female and grew up like that's who I'm interested in it. So, and they're like, Oh, so you're bisexual. I'm like, no, because it's one set. Like I, this, this language has made it impossible to communicate the reality of being homosexual because when you say woman, now some people assume you mean people with penises as well. And I, I don't, um, and when I say this is a woman only space, I am also including those women that have taken testosterone or have taken their breasts off because I still view those people as women. So even in the act of including those women who perhaps do not want to be called women, um, I am called a bigot for including the wrong kind of people. 
Um, so it, it really just kind of comes off as anti-female community to me. And when there's no female community, you can't have lesbian community. Um, and it's, it's a force, it's a force integration of the sexes. Um, I wonder if we can then jump from there to, um, gender affirming care and sort of the, as you, you mentioned, Ariane, this is a, not as big a problem for you being 34 as it is if you were 21, because it seems like the, uh, power behind the movement, uh, the trans movement, the money, the power, the push legislation, uh, the insurance waivers for procedures, just this is a top down, like billionaire funded organization coming at, uh, people. So what's it, what is it going on for children today? It seems like they don't want anyone to be a lesbian or gay anymore. It's just you're in the wrong body. Uh, how, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's weird being at the age that I am because it, it, it does seem like I'm sort of almost on the cusp between two generations. Um, uh, so yeah, so this, this was something that I first heard about, I think, when I was, maybe this was about in 2017, when I first heard of this phenomenon of, um, minors, people under 18 that were transitioning. At that time, I was still largely drinking the trans Kool-Aid. I was mostly on board the whole, you know, trans women are women, trans men are men thing. Um, but when I first heard that it was happening amongst minors, I couldn't help but feel a little bit uneasy about that because I just couldn't help but think of, you know, my own childhood and the childhood of so many people I know, so many gays and lesbians who had very gender nonconforming childhoods. And I'm like, well, okay, so would they be trans if, if they were children today? Like, who's, how are they deciding, you know, which, which children are trans? Like, but at the time, I sort of dismissed it, my concern at the time, because I thought, oh, this is probably a very marginal phenomenon. And it wasn't until actually around the pandemic times, 2020, when there was this huge increase in the number of detransitioners that were coming out. Mm -hmm people who had transitioned at a young age and now were regretting it. And I saw these videos and I'm like, this problem was if anything worse than I uh, initially thought. Um, and I agree that there's also, you know, a money component to it. Um, being a lesbian is hard to monetize. Um, and even, you know, for a while with gay men, they used uh, HIV you know, medication was a way of, of medical or way of monetizing that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that issue has sort of faded. And um, uh, going back, sorry to, to go back to the, the dating app thing, but one thing that turned me off from a, a dating app, her, which was geared towards so-called queer women, is they would give advertisements for testosterone. Like I got an email saying <laughs> microdosing. And I first I thought it was microdosing for cannabis. And it turned out it was microdosing for tea. And so I think that a lot of that is, is playing into that, that there's a big, um, industry that wants to sell their drugs also for the, the trans kids thing. Um, the puberty blocker issue, mm -hmm. um, Lupron, which was a puberty blocker, um, was a very controversial drug several years ago when it was uh, being used to treat precocious puberty. And it was being used to treat endometriosis. A lot of women who took that drug developed all sorts of problems, like with bone fractures, and were actually suing. <laughs> so, and and you could see if you do a Google search for before you know 2020, all a lot of, so much of what you're getting for Lupron was about all the health issues and all the the legal issues involved. And so now, voila. Mm. Uh, drug makers can now say, oh, we're, we're going to market this puberty blocker for trans kids. How, how could you, you know, these kids will commit suicide if they go through puberty naturally. We have to give them this. And it's a great way for drug, drug makers to now basically say, you know, find a way to experiment with their product and market their product to kids. Um, and sort of 
put on this sort of halo of, oh, we're just doing the good progressive thing. Right. I find that really lamentable. Well, we don't even let kids vote. We don't let uh, people under 25 rent a car. Uh, you can't buy cigarettes unless you're a certain age, but you can you can get into all this uh, and the schools are helping you out with it and behind the backs of parents. And to me, it's just, how did we get here so fast? And how did all the legislation change? And how did everyone drink the Kool-Aid at the same time? And to just be rational as you both are, suddenly you could lose a job. It's crazy. It's really a difficult time. Hey, WIOX here, 91.3 FM. We are alive and local in the Catskill Mountains. It's a community radio station. You can hear us at 91.3 FM and MTC Cable Channel 20 and at 107.5 FM on the campus of SUNY Delhi. And you can hear us everywhere at WIOXradio.org, where it is also easy to donate if you like what you hear. And a small independent radio station in the mountains founded by visionaries who wanted a free platform for hosts to present content, to represent their community. It's a very rare radio station. So if you want to contribute, it's very easy to do so on the site. And... Uh, and uh, now we're back here with Through the Looking Glass. And uh, again, I'm your host, Dennis, and we're going to go to the second part of our interview with uh, the two LGB Alliance organizers, representatives, Sylvia and Ariane, and they both have real interests in protecting women's spaces, protecting lesbian spaces, and uh, they're just very, very generous to share their time with me. I'm kind of, kind of getting my feet wet here, and uh, they really help me see a lot so i'm going to continue here basically with why did they join uh and has it affected them has it affected their careers being activists here um anyone who stands up to the trans movement with all the money they have has has suffered some so let's see what's going on with them um i could start um i joined mostly because at first i had no interest in volunteering i just wanted to, to talk about it and talk about these issues and i noticed that they were holding these zoom socials um and eventually i was invited to be a volunteer because i was in a discussion with a, another volunteer about it and i thought hmm, i don't really know what i could contribute but then i realized actually you know there's a a lot of things you can do and one of the things i did was i helped um write some of the statements that we would uh, push out or um you know like alerting people about a particular bill in the legislature or um one big project we did last year was when the department of education was making proposed changes to title nine um, we helped, you know, draft a statement that uh, basically talked about the implications this would have for lesbians and gays. So, and then, of course, there's just a lot of need for a social space. And that's largely what we've been doing is having these social events for gay, lesbian and bisexuals all over the country to talk about issues. And in terms of cost to my personal life, um, I've actually been okay, but I'm not open to everyone. <laughs> so I, I, thought I sort of test the waters before I, I, I explain my views to everyone. I've been pleasantly surprised by some of the conversations I've had with people, um, but there are also some some bridges that I'm not crossing yet. So mm -hmm. there's a need to self censor, unfortunately, at times. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. How about yourself, Sylvia? Yeah, so I I joined because I felt like I was watching the my community and world burn around me, and I just needed I, I needed to do something about it, um, particularly for the lesbians. Um, and I, I started by like Arianne said, the social, doing the social clubs. Um, I run a discussion group, um, for all LGB people, which has been really exciting to just hear all the different perspectives that people come for the tough topics that I bring up. Um, I also started this support group for women who experience dysphoria. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, dysphoria is typically what is, uh, 
seen as the cause of transitioning, you know, someone who wishes that they weren't their biological sex or they wish that they were the opposite biological sex. So um, the the LGBT Alliance has helped me kind of get that off the ground for young women who um, experience dysphoria but don't want to transition or maybe who have transitioned but don't feel that it's the right choice for them. Um, And then trying to take some of the the necessary information about this topic and delivering it in a way that is understandable to the greater public. Um, so I, I, I'm i getting better at it, but I, I've been making like media videos. Um, I have one video that took me a lot longer than it needed to, but it was a learning process where I basically just explained the difference between the LGB and the T because I think a lot of people just don't understand. They just hear LGBTQ community and, you know, and it's all the same. And it's like, no, 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 they actually mean things. And let's, the first three letters are its own, that sexual orientation. Everything else after that, totally different. And and so, you know, just kind of raising awareness about the difference between sexual orientation and advocacy for homosexuals and then this, this faith-based belief in gender identity and yeah. all of that. Um, my goal, my kind of dream with this LGB Alliance USA, I would love if we can grow our numbers of volunteers and community um, to the point where we can get an international dialogue with other countries and other countries can have their own LGB alliances and we can sort of work together to help homosexuals in countries where they're still put to death Mm. and where it's illegal to be openly gay. I would like to see that end in my lifetime. Um, I'd like homosexuals to be completely free to be who they are. Um, but that that's a little ways down the line and it would start with just supporting united states homosexuals and bisexuals and to even do that we have to just first sever the tq from the lgb to be like we are not the same and we are not fighting for the same things at all I was very guilty of that, you know, with the LGB movement and, and, um, you know, homosexuals getting the right to marry. And it's like, finally, hey, we're in a, we're in a sound, sane place here in America. And then the T got thrown in and it was like, okay, more love, you know, great. Oh, Q plus plus. Okay. And then, you know, when I started to work with a 17 year old who was thinking about transitioning, suddenly it was like, whoa, well, you're very young. Um, you want to like, why do you want to rush this? This is, this is serious. I started to do some research and then it totally jumped the shark when they said, you know, doctors aren't sure when you're born, if you're a male or a female, because you haven't decided yet. And I said, okay, this is just lunacy here. I'm sorry. This is just not reality. I'm not buying this. There's something really wrong here. And that's when I got active uh, with my own research. So when someone says gender fluid um, and you can be any gender you want, how do you guys respond to that? So can I, can I start, Arian? Um, since I used to identify as gender fluid, specifically gender queer, gender fluid for about three and a half years in college, go figure. Um, but it came from a real discomfort with my biological sex, which, um, you know, I've unpacked why I'm uncomfortable being a woman and specifically a homosexual woman and, and past experiences. And thankfully, thankfully, I had a really good therapist who had no training in the gender world. So she was just like, oh, you want to cut your breasts off? Let's explore why. And let's maybe work towards you embracing your body for what it is. You know, that should be the goal. Um, And I just think if I didn't have her and I went to any gender therapist and I told them that, I would not have breasts right now. So um, when I hear gender is fluid, it's it's i view it as a religious statement um it's the belief that we all have a a a soul that is you know man or woman and then we have our physical body and when our physical body is different than what our soul is that means we're trans and 
It used to be in my day, we called that having a dynamic personality where your personality just was a whole range of things and you could express yourself, look how you want, and you just were, but you were still a man or a woman because of your physical body. But this religion of gender ideology preaches that, you know, you can, your soul can be man or woman regardless of what your body is. And not just that, some souls actually are extra spe special and flow from one to the other or maybe you know have aspects of one and as you know so like for me i remember when i was identifying as gender fluid um it was not something i decided it was actually something i more discovered the internet told me i you know i just was i was looking up how to be a good trans ally all of a sudden i'm reading about this gender fluid i'm like oh well, i wear men's clothes oh i'm really uncomfortable with being perceived as a woman a lot of the time yeah i don't like wearing that i don't i don't talk like that oh i'm not a woman you know and i you know and i and as ariana was saying it's i was young i was 18 19 very still very impressionable you know i was off on my own for the first time and i was surrounded by this culture that really praised and kind of love bombed you if you were trans so you know and not just that i was escaping the a severe trauma and discomfort you know from what was pushing me to transition so all of that combined then i have this convenient excuse for oh i'm gender fluid it's not that i have trauma it's not that it sometimes sucks to be a woman it's not that i just am a tomboy it's there's because those things all make me weird and different i actually get to be this really cool thing and this sort of special thing where i i have a different gender identity than most people and i get my own flag and you know and i don't have to be a gross homosexual anymore i can be you know i can be the man in a relationship and fulfill that and then i don't have to feel like i'm a sinner or i'm a, you know just all of these things um and i and i promise Aaron, i'll let you talk i'm sorry just i this is my soapbox um you know, but I, I think so when I hear gender is fluid, what I hear, what I'm really hearing is, yeah, we all have dynamic personalities and we all have a self-expression. Um, sometimes I wonder if when someone says, oh, gender is fluid, if what they're saying is that biological sex is fluid. And that really makes me raise my eyebrows because I'm like, well, no, a woman is a woman, whether she can grow a beard or not. You know, it's. And, and and to claim that only men grow beards, it, it's just like I I I want to know what are the traits that are only for men? What are the traits that are only for women? Like being tall, is that a man trait? So does that mean that a really tall woman, she's actually gender fluid and part man? Like that? It's just so regressive and sexist. So um, there's the gender identity. Gender is fluid, which is like. Yeah, we all have personalities. And then there's the biological sex is fluid, which is basically just like physical attributes that can be seen on either sex somehow dictate that you're both sexes. Um, the iceberg is huge and we're just at the tip of it. But that's my short spiel on <laughs> gender fluidity. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Well, yeah, that was very well said. Um, the only thing I have, uh, to add is I have noticed that the definitions of gender queer and gender fluid, or at least the implications of that have actually changed over my lifetime. Because when I first was introduced to those words in high school, and this would have been in like 2007 and earlier, and, and then college after that, it, it still sort of had this meaning of, of sort of almost a playful meaning. Like it means like, I don't really care about gender roles. I can, I can be a man who wears, you know, flashy clothes and skirts, or I could be, you know, a woman who looks very butch. Like it, it, I didn't take it very literally. I just thought it was, it was just a way of sort of, you know, dismissing the value of conventional gender roles. But I've noticed for younger people and, you know, over the past several years, it's taken on a whole meaning of like a real identity like um gender queer or you know non-binary which seems to be it's the term that's more used now means like an actual literal like a different gender or a, a separate like essence of a person that has to um, be acknowledged 
not just in terms of behavior, not just like, oh, freedom to dress however they want to, but like you're somehow attacking the person if you don't use the right pronouns or you don't respect their identity. So I guess for me, when I, you know, if I were asked, you know, by someone who was considered themselves gender queer or gender fluid, I would simply ask them what they mean by that. Because I'm not entirely sure I've heard that term used consistently. Right. You guys, I want to thank you both, uh, Sylvia and Ariane, uh, for coming here from the LGB Alliance and sharing your thoughts, your views, um, your experiences. I, it's really helpful for me to hear it, uh, working with kids. So um, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, you're both very brave, very strong, and uh, very impressive women. So thank you. Thank you so, so much for having us. Keep Thanks up. a lot. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. This all is- right. So that was all the time we had to do our interview with Sylvia and Ariane. And uh, again, if you joined us late, they're from the LG. B Alliance, uh, LGB Alliance is an organization that was funded, founded to help, uh, respect lesbian, gay, and bi spaces and identities. Um, they're based in reality, respect, solidarity, clarity, and evidence. We just were hearing from Sylvia, who is a young activist focused on community building, supporting those who suffer from dysphoria. Uh, having ID'd as genderqueer for years and then eventually desisting helped deepen her understanding of sex, gender, and the relationships they have to sexual organization. And she's working counseling and helping others uh, figure out uh, their dysphoria. So you can reach out to her at the LGB Alliance. Also, we heard from Ariane, a lesbian millennial from the West Coast, and uh, she has interest in understanding sexual orientation, sex and gender in different cultures and in religions throughout the world. She also has an interest in critiquing the very, very notion of identity in all forms, and I'm so grateful for them. So again, the website is LGBA, Lesbian Gay by Alliance USA.org, LGBA USA.org, or just Google LGB Alliance USA and you will find it. The website has so much information, articles, videos. It's just very helpful um, if you want to check that out.